silicon CMOS were about one generation away from the end of end of that train. It's had a great 55-year run, and it'll be, uh, uh, you know, I think it has another five years of major technology investment. Once we get to the 11 nanometer feature size, um, there's really we're we're running out of atoms on our gates, which means that the devices just don't work anymore. So the the, the cost difference between you know, going from 32 to 22 to 14 to 11 nanometers, just the, the investment curve is, is becoming very steep. Um, so it looks like there are only two companies in the world uh, that will go beyond 20 nanometer uh, CMOS manufacturing or have the, the technical and financial wherewithal to do so. And as a long time uh, chip architect and semiconductor device designer, um, CMOS is really, it's, you know, we got to the point where we, we can't really get performance improvements anymore. You know, we make something smaller, which historically would make it faster, but um, due to other, other issues associated with devices that now have so few atoms <laughs> lined up on a gate that, uh, that uh, it's, really, it's really come to its logical end. So I think the, the strength of, of what Jeff has done and, and what Opal's tech, Poet technology is, is not as, a, not as an enhancement to, to the existing gallium arsenide or compound semiconductor market, but really something that's, uh, something that's applicable to everywhere that semiconductors are used today, particularly where, where CMOS silicon is used today and how it's used. Um, I guess with uh, these guys will probably be looking at me saying, get out of the weeds, get out of the weeds, stop talking about that. But uh, I think in terms of, of what Opal has in Poet, it's, uh, it's something that the world, the technology world has been pursuing for at least 20 years on a pretty organized basis and a many, many pronged effort across the industry. Um, and for one reason or another, um, every one of those efforts that I'm familiar with painted themselves into a, a technical corner where they got a few functions working very well, committed to that process and started developing products, and then realized that when they went back to try and extend it to do more things, to try and realize you know, the, the promise of electro-optical semiconductor integration, they realized that they had committed to something, a technology that couldn't do that. Um, in fact, I won't mention any names, but I was the company I was involved with immediately before Opal. Nortel. <laughs> not that one. We <laughs> can talk about that company's problems all day. <laughs> uh, uh, the last company I was involved in was an example of a company that uh, that focused on the optical side of electro-optical integration, committed to some products, and uh, now have realized that what they have is an optical technology, not an electro-optical integrated technology. And they were just the last example of those casualties that you know, the industry has generated. You may find this a question out of place when you should have been asked earlier. Optics and electronics. Can you just tell us that uh, over time? Uh, optics involves light and electronics involves electricity. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being facetious. Uh, if you, most systems today, whether they're compute systems, networking systems, they have everything that goes on inside the box is handled electrically. So your, your, your PC that you have, everything inside that box is, is, is all the signals, all the data that work with in an electrical manner. And typically, optical functionality comes in at the interface. If you have a server that is a gigabit or 10 gigabit connection, you convert the electrical signals to optical signals, send them in the form of light down fiber, receive signals on the fiber and convert them back to electricity for processing. Um, <coughs> Optical systems are uh, typically, the costs come partly from the bill of materials and the exotic materials that are used to make them, but also because optics, unlike electrical stuff, has to be mechanically aligned. Anybody that's bought a cheap <coughs> pair of binoculars where the two barrels aren't aligned and they get a headache almost right away from looking at it can appreciate that any optical system has to be very carefully assembled and aligned. And for any of you guys that know about manufacturing, the more precisely you have to do something, the more expensive it is to do. So there's been a, a, a long-term industry interest in taking uh, optical technologies 
that have to be assembled out of discrete components today with great precision and at great cost and integrate them onto one chip such that all of your all of your fine tolerance work can be done using photolithography, not by using you know ever more expensive Chinese labor, which is how the stuff is built today. Uh, <clears throat> so there's the the idea of integrating optical and electrical functionality, and that has a, a you know that has a, a tremendous value proposition for optical transceivers, any system that has optical <coughs> interfaces. I think what's what's uh, poet actually goes beyond that. Um, we can integrate electro optical functionality onto the same die that does purely electrical processing. It can run much faster than. Uh, than CMOS technology can. Um, the first prototype transistors we built, uh, to give you an idea, you know, uh, a CMOS transistor would run at maybe three and a half gigahertz, which is a little bit faster than your fastest Intel processor would go today. Um, and Jeff's first transistor prototypes that he produced two and a half years ago, they ran at like 65 gigahertz, and they were 100 times bigger than the CMOS transistors today. So the performance is not really comparable. It's two different worlds. They're very different materials. Um, so I think what, what's, what's interesting about Poet is you know, beyond the electro integration, and the, the very high performance electrical or electronic processing that can be done uh, is, excuse me, is that uh, there's also a very significant capability um, to do optical processing, which means actually processing data in optical well, and switching it in optical. Why is an optical signal better than an electronic signal? Uh, well, I guess the short, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I think the, the answer is they're not always better, but they're different. Uh, optical signals, their, their great power is that they have, they're not affected by capacitance, no electrons have to move. Um, they can go at high speeds and they can typically go long distances without attenuation. That was the, you know, if anybody remembers how much our phone bills dropped when we went from copper long haul transmission lines to, to fiber optics, it's because you can put a signal into, uh, an optical signal into a piece of fiber and, uh, you know, one watt of power will take you hundreds of kilometers before you have to regenerate the signal, whereas one watt of power in an electrical system would take you probably maybe hundreds of inches, <laughs> you know, not very far. So they're, they, I mean, electrical signals have their uses and, and optical signals have their, their uses as well. Um, the, the tremendous value, I think, of POET is that if we look purely at the electronic business, the, the, C, the CMOS silicon replacement technology in POET um, can do anything that CMOS silicon can do and can do it an order of magnitude maybe 10 to 15 times faster than, than a comparable CMOS technology. We have the ability to integrate optical functionality in today that today requires multiple separate components and significant assembly costs and test costs. Um, but also, sometimes with, a, with POET, we won't have to convert optical signals to electrical and back. We can do significant processing um, in optical form. So we can actually, uh, you know, system backplanes, for example, if somebody's seen a networking switch from Cisco, there's a bunch of cards that plug into this big circuit board full of connectors to the back, and that card at the back is just full of wires connecting the slots together. Uh, Jeff's technology could eliminate the backplane. All you need is a, is a light pipe with some spigots coming off it, that's it. So we're, you know, that, that's one example of massively simplifying uh, an existing piece of networking equipment. Um, and really what, what, what Jeff has done is he's developed three key technologies. Uh, he's developed, uh, and they're three firsts. Uh, he's developed a complementary P and N channel uh, transistor pair uh, that has never been made in anything but, but uh, CMOS silicon before. Um, it's, uh, this is the first time that, that people have been able to make it work in, in Galley Marcinite. Uh, so those electronic components on their own have a tremendous value proposition, leaving the optical stuff alone. The third piece of this, of this technology is uh, something called an optical thyristor. 
and he has spent uh, 12 years just on the thigh wrister design, and uh, we're actually fabbing some of those at uh, that British Aerospace in one of their fabs uh, over the next few months. Uh, these devices are uh, very interesting because they're so versatile. They can be used as a laser. They can be used as actually several kinds of laser. Uh, they can be used as, as a, a, a detector. So I need either detecting infrared or visible light or um, whatever kind of energy level that you want to detect. They can detect. And what's truly unique about this is that the same optical thyristor can be used for both. So one of the reasons that the Defense Department, as I said, uh, as the U.S. Department of Defense is so interested in funding this technology and has really funded it for 15 years, you know, we're still getting grants from, from NASA that we're still spending. Um, and their, their big motivation to, uh, to pursue this technology is that you can build an array, today you can build an array of, of detectors, you know, that's the night vision equipment that everybody's you know, seen in movies works. Um, or you can build lasers that can shoot things or shoot people. Um, <laughs> Jeff's technology can do both. So basically you can have a panel, an array, <laughs> that is configured as a detector and in microseconds, I mean millionths of a second, you can change the bias on those things and turn them into lasers. So you can, so in a military application, your, your radar panel is also your directed energy weapon. Um, and this is, uh, you know, it sounds like Star Wars, but it actually works. And uh, the, re the reason that, that it works is that the U.S. defense complex has, has put money into this technology for years, and uh, they believe in it. You know, that's why they, they keep funding it. So I think what, what Jeff has is, uh, you know, the, the interesting thing about this is that there's such, uh, there's such a breadth of applications for the technology that, uh, you know, there are many processor vendors, for example, um, this will allow their architectures to not be so reliant on multi-core parallel processing, which most of you have heard about and some of you probably invested money in. And one of the dirty little secrets about, about the parallel processing world and the multi-core world is that most software can't take advantage of it. You know, you have to, you have to rewrite your programs and think about problems in very different ways to map them out to all these low-speed parallel CPUs. It's not the natural way that many problems are calculated or solved. And uh, Jeff's technology, um, you know, you could make a, a, an Intel Atom-sized processor that could run a single <coughs> execution stream as fast or faster than any of the six or eight core processors from Intel today to, to process a parallel workload. So I think it's, uh, you know, that's just one example of how staying away from optics or defense stuff or anything else, there's one industry that's just coming to the end of their current technology life, lifetime, and uh, this is something that really opens up new architectures, fundamentally lower cost points for, uh, you know, all kinds of software applications. Um, you know, if you look at the electro-optical transceiver business, there are a number of companies in the world today that they butter their bread by buying electro-optical components, probably six or eight, um, and integrating them, them together in a high-speed module, which has fibers coming out one side and electrical signals coming out the other. Um, the POA technology essentially eliminates those companies' value proposition because you don't have to integrate these things together into a high-speed module anymore. All of it goes on one chip. No human intervention in terms of having to align parts and uh, use dissimilar materials and have multiple pieces connected to a ceramic board. One chip in a cheap package does it. And uh, you know, that's just two examples of existing industries that are only peripherally related to one another, each of which can and I believe will be turned on their head by poet by poet technology. 